Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome again. Oh, sorry, my computer is. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome again to another Rust meetup. This is uh, wonderful to see you all. Uh, it's been a really long time coming, and I'm glad that we've had so many people uh, show up here. So uh, tonight's uh, event is all about some of the really neat concurrency and parallelism libraries that have started to come out of the community. But you know, we're back. Yay. Sorry that we had such a long break. Uh, I've already got things lined up for you know, the next couple months. So hopefully we won't have a big gap like this again. Uh, but as tradition, uh, thank you again, Mozilla, for feeding us and providing this lovely space. You guys are awesome. Uh, so tonight we have Nico. Uh, oh, this is a little small. Oh, Nico, right there, is on the camera. Uh, Nico will be talking about his library uh, rayon for doing very simple uh, threading. Uh, Aaron will be talking about crossbeam for writing concurrent data structures, and then Huon will close out the evening uh, with simple parallel. Um, and then also, just wanted to mention that I've already announced uh, the next Rust meetup in February. Uh, you should sign up. Uh, please sign up for the waitlist. We had people, 50 people signed up for the meetup before I even announced it. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a number of drop-offs. So, you know, feel free. Okay. All right. I'm going to pass this off to uh, Nico. Thank you. Please give him a warm welcome. Hello, everybody. Um, as you can see, I'm calling in from Boston. It's a little bit chillier here than I, I think it is probably over there. But uh, so, right, I'm going to talk to you about Rayon. So I guess we might as well bring up the slides, actually. Um, hopefully, you can see these. Look good? OK. Yell <laughs> loudly if something's wrong. It's uh, all right. still all black. and. Now green. No. Um, All right, let's see. Let me try something else. Let me do it like this. Can you we see can it now? now? Yes, it's up. OK. All right. So, um, right, so I'm going to talk about Rayon, which is a library for doing data parallelism. And basically, what data parallelism means, at least to me, <laughs> is you have a lot of data, and you'd like to process it in parallel, right? And this is a little bit disjoint from, like, task parallelism, which is kind of, I have a lot of different things I want to do, and I want to do them in parallel, but they're not operating. It's not that I have a big array I want to subdivide or something like that, right? So the goal of Rayon really is to be able to take sequential code that you wrote and make it run in parallel very easily with sort of minimal effort and minimal risk that it's going to do the wrong thing. Right, so here's an example of a piece of sequential code that iterates over a list, a slice or a vector or whatever, of stores. And for each store, it calls compute price, which is going to do some computation. And then I'm going to sum up the results. Right? And this is a sequential iteration. Um, so it seems like it's pretty clear what it's going to do. But if I happen to know that, let's say, uh, all of these computations for computing the price can be done in parallel independently with one another. I'd like it if all it took to, to make this run in parallel is to kind of change this dot iter to something like dot par iter. Right? Hey, Nico. In other languages. Hey, sorry to interrupt mm -hmm. for a sec. Uh, it looks like on the actual oh, slides. Oh, yeah, this like recursive video. thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. All right. Let me see if I can figure out how to make that not show up. Or at least show up less. Yeah. Uh, well, it's still displayed. A little bit. I know. Maybe one of these icons will do it. <laughs> I, uh, maybe you can just drag it to the bottom of the screen, or that's what I'm trying to do. It doesn't seem to want to go down to the bottom there. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. I can make it much that, bigger. That looks better. It's kind of amazing. I can do it over the side, perhaps. There we go. All right. Let's try that. All right. So that, um, that looks good. All right. So I'd like to be able to just write par iter, and now I would have the same semantics, but it would run in parallel. Right. 
Um, so it would do each store. Well, let's say it would potentially run in parallel. It would divide, and the reason I say potentially is that it'll depend a lot on the computer you're using, right? If you have, if you're running on a single core CPU, it may not make any sense to go in parallel, or if the computer is busy doing other things. Uh, but um, but if you have the resources, you'd like to use them. Right. So the the kind of goals of Rayon, as I just said, is there is the first goal, I guess, is is this that it should really be able to enable parallelism very easily with minimal work but give you some ability to customize and control it later when you need it, um, if you want to get the maximum performance. And another important point is you should be able to do parallelism as a kind of implementation detail. And what I mean by that is if you have some function that's doing sequential work, I'd like to be able to convert it to do parallel work, and, or to do the work in parallel, and none of the callers of that function ever have to know. The signature of the function doesn't change. Um, it's just something that happens inside, right? It just gets done faster. And finally, it's really important to guarantee data race freedom. And what I mean by this is, so I said we want to make parallelism easy. And I showed you an example where it was very ergonomic. You didn't have to type a lot. That's not the only factor in making things easy, right? You also want to know that when you do this, your program is not going to suddenly do the wrong thing or have undefined behavior or compute crazy results. So I'd like it that if you say that something is parallelizable and you're wrong, you get a compilation error. That would be the goal. Um, so basically, if you put all that together, what it means is you should be able to sprinkle kind of willy-nilly parallel hints and suggestions without a lot of fear that something is going to go amiss and your program is going to start misbehaving. So what Rayon basically, where its current status is, I would say it's still very experimental. I don't think people should build production systems on it. However, it's pretty promising, and I think it delivers on these goals, uh, you know, pretty well, basically. Um, and there's there's some caveats and things, but basically it's able to do all these things that I'm talking about, as we'll see in this in this talk. Uh, so I showed you this Parallel Iterator API, Parallel Iterator API, uh, which is something that's in the Parallel, or in the Rayon library, but it's not the foundation of Rayon. It's actually just a kind of uh, layer built on top of a more primitive API, which is what I'm going to spend most of my time talking about. And that API is called Join. So what join does is it takes two closures, um, as you can see here, and it calls those two closures essentially potentially in parallel. So it may start another thread to do one of those closures, and then they would execute in parallel, and it'll wait until they're both finished. But it might also just execute them sequentially, if that makes more sense. Um, so the goal is you should be able to add join. This is kind of the thing that you sprinkle around, right? Wherever parallelism is possible, and then let the library in runtime essentially decide when it's profitable to use it. So join is really well suited to divide and conquer kind of algorithms. Um, you're probably familiar with this term, but basically the idea is you have some big problem you have to solve and it's kind of intimidating and you're not sure how to solve it, but you can break it up into two smaller problems and then you can recursively try to solve those. And if you keep doing this, eventually you get down to some really tiny problem that's really easy, right? And the idea is that when you're doing this kind of divide and conquer step, each time that you, you divide up into two problems, you can call join to process those two problems in parallel. So let me show you an example. Um, this is quicksort, my favorite sort, probably everybody's favorite sort. Um, I imagine most of you know quicksort, or maybe more accurately, once knew quicksort. Um, and since then, I've just used it as a library. That's kind of how I was for a long time, uh, until I wrote this blog post that I'm basing this on. But so quick sort, let me just kind of briefly review how it works real fast. It's a, it's a classic divide and conquer kind of algorithm. Um, so what it does is you've got a, a slice of data that you, you want to process. And, and, you know, it starts out in some random order, like 1, 22, 3, 2, 6, or whatever. And you're going to start out by saying, well, first of all, if it's length 1, I'm, I'm done, right? A one length array is always sorted. Otherwise, you're going to pick, you're going to do this partitioning step, which means we're going to pick a number, which we call the pivot. And we're going to move everything that's less than the pivot to one side and everything that's greater to the other. So we're going to rearrange the array in, in place. That's what partition does. So here, if we pick three as the pivot, we would rearrange everything. So we have one, three, two on the left, and then 22 and six on the right. And we have this midpoint that gets returned, which is basically where was the dividing line. 
such that everything to the left was less and everything to the right was 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 greater. Um, and now this is what we can use to, to divide up our problem, right? So we can call split at mute, which is a method that takes one slice and gives you back two split around some midpoint. Um, and we'll end up with here two, basically two slices now, one pointing at the left half, everything that was less than or equal to the pivot, and one pointing at the right half, everything that was greater than the pivot. And now I can recursively process them. So when I'm done, I'll have first I'll sort the left half and then I'll sort the right half. Okay, pretty easy. So if I wanted to parallelize this, well, I can just do what I said and insert a call to rayon join exactly at the point where I have two sub problems. So this is the parallel quick sort. It looks pretty similar, except here I'm calling join. Um, and uh, so you see that it took very minimal work to do this, but what's even more exciting and I think very cool about this is that we didn't change the signature at all. Right? So we're actually doing a, you know, not a completely trivial thing to parallelize here because we have mutation going on um, and we're also potentially working with stack allocated data. These things are usually a little bit tricky to get right because if you start up a thread, uh, it runs asynchronously with respect to the, this person, who, the, the stack frame that started it. So working with stack allocated data can be a little risky. If you return or do something wrong, you might pop that data while the other thread is still active. Um, but the reason that all this works with Rayon is that basically we're because join always waits until both threads have finished before it returns, you know that it can have safe access to stack allocated resources just fine um, because basically the stack frame isn't going to return until both threads have done. So the library kind of handles that aspect for you. And that makes sense for if you're taking a sequential algorithm, you were going to do both those things anyway before you return. So you might as well wait for the threads to finish. Right? It's the same algorithm from the caller's point of view. Um, and in terms of mutation, this works out very well because of Rust's basic type system, which guarantees you that if you have a, a mutable reference to something, then you're the only one that has access to that data. So it's okay to put it to another thread and let that other thread mutate it because no one else can be reading it. But we'll see a little more on that in, in a bit. Um, I want to start out though, I want to focus instead on talking about how, how does Rayon decide when to run things in parallel at all? Right. And the technique that, that I'm using is something called work stealing, which I did not invent at all. Right. It's been around a long time. And uh, uh, I think it was invented, at least the first time I know of it, by Silk, which was a project at MIT from the, I think the 90s. And um, that Silk is actually now available as part of Intel's C compiler. And there have been a number of projects that have used it in the meantime. So it's a really time honored, <laughs> well, well-respected technique. And the basic idea is, is like this. Rather, tr traditionally when you parallelize, you might take a bunch of work and assign it to different threads. But work stealing is more of a dynamic load balancing idea. Right? So I have a bunch of threads in a pool. In this case, let's say I have two threads. And they're going to find work for themselves. So let me show you kind of it's easier to illustrate it than to describe it. So we start out with two threads here. And thread B is basically idle initially it has no work to do but thread a starts out with the job of the big the big the big problem that i started with so in this case that's quick sort that's what qs stands for calling quick sort on a slice let's say it's 22 elements long to start right then uh we saw that what quick sort does once it starts working on a particular problem is it subdivides the problem into two two sub problems and then it calls join on both of them and what join is going to do basically is take these two closures and it's going to start executing the first closure. But just before it does that, it's going to post a little, a little note into a thread local queue with the second closure. So this queue is basically tracking work that we plan to do later, but we haven't gotten to it yet. So we're starting in on zero to 15 and then we've put in the queue of 15 to 22 so we can pick it up later. Um, and when we process 0 to 15, we'll again subdivide into two tasks and we'll put one in the queue. That's the 1 to 15. And we'll start in on 0 to 1 right away. This is the one length array, so it's going to finish. And when it finishes, what it's going to do is go over to this queue and take off the most recent thing that it put in. So it's actually a double ended queue or a deck. You can use it like a stack or a queue. It's a minor point. Um, but that means we're going to say, okay, 
Well, we finished zero to one. So the next thing we have to do is this piece of pending work one to 15. And we'll go over and execute that. And this is where it gets a little interesting. So all this time I've been talking about thread A and thread B has just been idle, right? Um, so what thread B is gonna do is while, a, whenever a thread is idle, in order, it tries to find work for it to do. And it does that by looking at all the queues from all the other threads. So now a thread B might come over and say, you know, I've got nothing to do. And thread A has this, this uh, 15 to 22 task just hanging out in its queue. Maybe I'll be helpful and I'll take that work on. And we call that stealing. So thread B is gonna steal this task and execute it. And it's called stealing, but it's kind of a weird sort of stealing. It's like if a thief came into your house and saw that you hadn't finished your dishes and started doing them for you, right? It's pretty nice. It's a nice kind of stealing. Um, so thread B is going to execute 15 to 22 and it'll do the same thing. It'll subdivide this up into two problems and post one of them into its local queue and start in on the first one. And it'll do that again. And so it basically works exactly the same way, right? Um, so now when it finishes a problem, it'll take something off of its queue, just like thread A did. And so let's say now it's processing here. Now, if we come back to thread A for a second, so we've seen that both of these uh, threads are kind of doing the same thing. They're processing an item, pushing some of the work into a queue and doing the other half. So let's say thread A finishes the work it was doing and then comes along here. Now it's finished both sub problems. So it's completely done with zero to 15. And now it would go to this next item in the queue, but it can't because thread B stole it away. So that basically now it just has to wait in order to do 15 to 22, thread B's already started. It just has to wait for thread B to finish. That means thread A is idle. And when threads are idle, they go look for other work to do. So now we can go look at thread B's queue and we can say, hey, here's some work that thread B had started but hasn't finished yet, 18 to 22. I could steal that back, right? And so now thread A is gonna do 18 to 22 while thread B is over there. And you can kind of imagine now this proceeds like this until all the work is done. So everybody kind of just does the work they have. They create new work and throw it on their queue and hopefully somebody else takes it before they can even get to it, right? So it's kind of like if that thief came in and was washing my dishes and I see that they haven't yet gotten to a particular pan, I could take it back and start working on it. Um, so everyone's working together to finish all the problems. So what's nice about this is you get a kind of dynamic load balancing effect. So it might be quicksort is not the best example of that, but if, well, even here you can see actually the tasks don't all take the same time, right? Some of them are for big pieces of the array. Some of them are for smaller pieces of the array. Um, and so if you have tasks that take a variable amount of time, which is often the case, then it's really hard to pre-allocate those to threads because you might end up giving one thread a lot of really big expensive tasks and another thread a bunch of really easy tasks. And then the other thread will finish really fast and you just won't get a very efficient use of your, your, your resources. But with work stealing, that's not a big problem because if one thread finishes fast, it'll just go take work from the other threads and try to take care of that instead. Um, so here's a big wall of code. Uh, this is kind of the, the header of join and a little bit of pseudocode. And the reason I'm showing you all this code is that I wanna kind of highlight some of the, the Rust features that let, let you write something like join as a library in Rust and have it work pretty efficiently, which I, I think is pretty cool. Um, so if you remember, join takes two closures and closures in Rust, here's the, the arguments to join, opera A and opera B, those are the two operations. Um, closures in Rust are just generic types that implement this, this callable trait, right? So here A and B are the types corresponding to the closures. And, and here is where we say that they must implement the function ones trait, which means that they have to be callable at most once. Um, and uh, the reason that these are like actually two distinct types and why that's really nice is it means that every time you call join, you'll get a custom version of join. The compiler will monomorphize, meaning it'll create a custom version of join specialized to those particular closures. That means that LLVM can basically inline and do optimization and hopefully uh, in general, basically reduce the overhead of join in the sequential case. So there's no virtual dispatch, there's only static dispatch and so forth. Um, now, 
this is the, the kind of pseudocode for what I just described. So if you remember, we always push something on the queue and then execute the other task. So here's the, the push onto the queue part. And the thing I want to highlight here is that we don't do any allocation when we push on the queue, or we don't necessarily, at least in the common case. The, oper the actual closure that we're pushing on the queue, we can just push a reference to the closure that lives on the stack. So we don't even have to allocate any memory to do that, right? It's just a, a few writes. And then we can call the, the first closure and then execute the second closure. And each of these calls, as I said, are statically dispatched, which means they can be inlined very, effect uh, very easily by LLVM and analyzed very easily. And then finally here, this is just a little loop that says, well, if, if somebody stole my work, then I'll, I'll help out until it's ready. Um, and this basically, this while loop is essentially what causes join to wait until both threads have finished. Okay, the last thing on this slide that I just sort of glossed over is this send trait. So what this is saying is, uh, if, you, if, you, if you are familiar with Rust, you'll know, but so send is basically, or if you've used multiple threads in Rust, you probably encountered send, I should say. And send is basically the trait that identifies data types which are safe to send to another thread. So it's um, things which can be safely transported between threads and won't cause any data races, right? And so when I, when I say that the closures have to be send, what I mean is all the data that you use from your closures. So in the case of quicksort, that would be the array that we're sorting and so forth, has to be sendable to another thread. And that makes sense because join might cause those two threads to execute in parallel, or it might not. But in the case that it does, the data had better be safe to go to another thread. Now, as it happens in Rust, most types actually are send. Right? Almost everything is sendable by default. The only exception is basically these, these three types and things that use these three types. Um, so if you use the RC type, the reference counted data, that's not thread safe because the reference counted data doesn't use the correct atomic operations to increment the ref count, which means if, if two different threads increment the ref count at the same time, they might mess it up, basically. But you can use the ARC version, which is the thread safe version, and it will work just the same. Um, and the next two, ref cell and cell, are basically the ways to introduce mutation into alias data. They're a little bit tricky. Uh, suffice to say, there are thread safe equivalents, like mutex and atomic I32. But you have to be a little bit careful. So if you find that you're getting compilation errors um, due to the fact that you have cell and ref cell, what that's kind of telling you is this code is not going to be trivial to parallelize. So this gets back to the safety guarantees I was talking about in the first place. If you're just adding parallelization and you wind up getting errors, you're actually getting pretty useful information. You're saying that this that there's some shared state that gets mutated. Um, and you want to think about it. You could add a mutex or some other mechanism, but at that point, it's no longer guaranteed that your parallel version is going to behave the same as your sequential version. So you have to think about it a little bit. Um, and so that's one aspect of safety, basically, uh, that we want to make sure that you don't transport types that are not thread safe across threads. And then the other is you want to make sure that you don't transport the same data, especially mutable data, across threads. Right, so this is a version of Quicksort, which is almost the same as the correct version, except that instead of sorting the, the low and the high on the two different threads, it actually sorts the low on both threads. Um, and it's kind of, in, it's kind of funny that I, I've been using this as an example for, for a while, and I always thought, well, I don't know if people will really make such a simple mistake, but then when developing Rayon, I actually made several mistakes exactly like this several times, and the compiler caught them for me, and I was very happy. So uh, what will happen, basically, if you do something like this, where you accidentally use the same state on both threads, is that the compiler will complain, and that's the message you get. And what it's telling you is, um, basically, that if you want to mutate state in Rust, you have to have unique access to it. So here, I have two closures. They both have access to the same data, so neither one has unique access. Right? Um, and what's, what's cool is that this, this rule wasn't designed with parallelism in mind, but it, it fits parallelism very well. Um, so that the compiler isn't really, doesn't necessarily know that these run in parallel, but it knows that it needs to keep mutable access um, 
unique. And so it just kind of falls out from that. So you can't share a mutable state, but you can very easily share a read-only state, which is exactly what you want. Um, so that's how join works. And I've kind of dumped through it, delved through it in some detail. So this API that I showed you in the beginning was a parallel iterator. And I'm not gonna go into it in this talk because uh, I don't wanna take a long time. But basically you can build up the parallel iterator in almost entirely safe code uh, using join. And in fact, it was building the parallel iterator API is where I made that mistake of passing the same half to both half, both, both closures, um, at least when building Rayon. So, uh, so that's pretty cool that, that join is actually flexible enough to be used kind of build up abstractions on top that are, that are even easier to use and apply to other situations. And uh, there is, I have written up the details of how this works, at least at a certain level. It's in a blog post that I'll show a link to later. So if you're interested, you can go check it out. Um, but the basic idea is that it will divide up the work that the iterator is going to do recursively in the same fashion. Right? So in conclusion, I guess, there's a couple of points I wanted to, to kind of bring across. And these, the point that I really don't want to get across here is you should go use Rayon. Um, what I do want to get across is I think there are some, some goals and lessons to be learned from Rayon that I think we should try to incorporate. And whether the, I hope we will end up with a package much like Rayon, which is very widely used. It doesn't have to be Rayon. I'd be perfectly happy if somebody else were a better one. But I think these are some really important things about it. We really want to have optional parallelism, which means you want to be able to say what can run in parallel, right? What, what would make sense to run where the program will still be correct, but you don't want to have to say exactly what will run, how many threads there are going to be, if there will even be threads. It's just, it's kind of annoying to do so. It makes your programs complicated and it's really hard to get it right. And it's actually ultimately something that's going to depend a lot on the environment where you're running the code anyhow. So you'd rather just have it be something that's dynamically figured out for you. Um, oops. And the other thing is that Rust really it offers a great foundation for writing this kind of library, right? So the, the borrow checking rules basically give you data race freedom. As I showed you, like you get this mutable estate is uniquely accessed by default. That's just the normal thing. Um, so that actually goes both ways. That's great for the library author because it makes it easy to get this, uh, these kind of guarantees you want, but it's also great for you when you're writing sequential code, you're kind of writing parallel ready code uh, without even realizing it, so to speak, um, just because that's the way that you normally work to, uh, with code in Rust. And the fact that we have these lightweight closures that can be stack allocated, that have static linking and easy inlining also means you can do kind of just in the compiler, you can build up a lot of great low cost abstractions. So I'm pretty excited about that. I think it's worked out very well. And the last thing I'm gonna show you is uh, just a couple links. These are more for people who come and look at the video later, but um, this is where the Rayon project is on GitHub. And this really, really long URL that I had to put in a small font is actually the blog post that I was talking about that kind of goes over everything I said here, but in somewhat more detail. So that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Um, if you have some questions, I would love to answer them. I guess, I don't know if we do questions. <clears throat> Yeah, there, there are microphones out in the audience. Hi, thanks. I had a question about uh, how work stealing might interact with uh, cache uh, invalidation. If two jobs are frequently stealing pieces back and forth from each other, could that have uh, performance implications? Yes. Um, it, it can. Uh, I'm trying to think now. So work stealing is usually does actually fit very well with cache algorithms. And the reason is because, because of a kind of specific detail that I didn't go into too much detail on in this where I showed it, but because what you, what, the way it works is you start out with these really big problems and you, you recur, so you make them smaller, right? And each step you're pushing basically a, onto your queue, a really 
bigger, well, you start out with kind of the queue has the really big problems at the top and they get smaller and smaller as they go down, right? And so the task, when a task goes, it always pulls from its own queue from the bottom. So it takes the smallest task, basically the, the most recently pushed thing, which means it's the most likely to have the same cache behavior as the thing you just did, right? So you get kind of maximum locality that way. But when you steal, you steal from the other side, which means you're stealing the work that is most remote from what you're from what the processor is doing right now, and thus the one that is kind of represents a big chunk, like the the right half of the array. Um, that'll be kind of a whole different cache, uh, you know. So it's kind of just it would get the the minimum benefit basically from from being executed by the original processor. Uh, however, I. I'm not sure. I mean, most of the kind of papers and things that I saw that did measurements, I think, were pretty old. So I'm not sure, like, modern architectures are different, and I'm not sure if anyone's done any recent studies. But I know that the ones that I saw, they showed quite good cache behavior. Nice. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so I was wondering, uh, does all the code using Rayon all throughout my crate and its dependencies, do they all share the same thread pool? So. The implementation by default, yes. Uh, I have some code path in there that's not very well tested that lets you create additional thread pools and um, in a kind of dynamically scoped fashion. So you can kind of enter into a thread pool and then the work that executes within there will go in that separate thread pool. But in general, it's probably not a good idea unless you have a specific reason that there should be multiple thread pools. Uh, it's usually a good idea to share them because You've only got so many cores, essentially. So, so you were talking a bit about the safety of Rayon, part of that having to do with data races. Uh, but you mentioned in passing that if you use something like a mutex, you can accidentally reveal the fact that these things are running in parallel. Have you thought about a way to rule that out, similar to send? I haven't, um, mostly because I think it's really useful. Um, so there are a lot of parallel, or there are a lot of algorithms where you actually want to communicate between the parallel workers. Um, so a simple example is a kind of branch and bound search where you're, you're or, or something like this, where you're kind of searching through a space and you want to know what's the best result that anyone has found so far. Um, and if you're running sequentially, that's just going to be, you know, the, the current, what the current thread has found so far. But if you do have the opportunity to parallelize, you like to know if someone else found a better result somewhere else so that you can stop searching unproductive avenues. Um, so this is used to like solve traveling salesman problem and stuff like that, right? Um, so I'm not sure that's a problem basically that you can reveal the parallel execution. Like if you're using a mutex already, you're already in a parallel mindset. You've already delimited your transactional boundaries where you acquired the lock and unlocked it. Um, so I'd be surprised if it actually led to bugs in code, but it does seem like we one could add something like send, except that I don't know. I haven't thought about it yeah. that hard, but it could be. A it seems like you could probably rule it out. It could be a good application of lattice variables, like the kind of thing you were talking about. If the state is monotonically growing or something like that, you still get a determinism guarantee. Yes. <laughs> Any other questions, uh, Kevin? When work stealing, how does Rayon deal with thread priorities? Well, it doesn't really, right? So, um, <laughs> it it gives it gives all the so this kind of comes back to some extent to the to the shared thread pool question that was raised earlier, right? So, if you have multiple uh, threads with different priorities and they're each starting up parallel tasks we don't give one thread pool higher priority. Like, we don't give the, the tasks in the thread pool all have equal priority wherever they came from. Um, it's an interesting idea. I don't, I don't know how you would extend it to cover priorities except by having distinct thread pools with different, uh, pri uh, just leveraging the, the OS, like, priorities that way. Well, could threads acquire the priority of the thread that they're stealing the work from? Potentially. Um, the challenge is that they can get mixed, they can get mixed, uh, like there's, 
there's one thread pool, right, which is basically a totally different set of threads than the one that are normally used in your application. So you can have tasks intermingled from different application threads in there, which may have different priorities. So I guess they could set and unset the priority as they go. Um, that might be a good way to do it. I'm not sure. What it's worth, I think that's how libdispatch does it on OS X. Any other questions? Okay, once. All right. Thank you, Nico, so much. <laughs> Next up is Aaron. That's, there we go. Cool, thanks. Okay, everybody hear me? Cool, hey everybody. Uh, I'm Aaron Tehran, uh, another member of the Rust team here at Mozilla. Uh, and I'm excited tonight to tell you about a library I've been working on called Crossbeam. Um, so Crossbeam is targeted at sort of a different layer of the stack than the library that we just saw. Um, so Nico's library Rayon is all about writing uh, sort of introducing parallelism into your program, and it relies on some underlying data structures like work stealing queues. Crossbeam is targeted at those kinds of data structures, basically. So it's, it's a library for high performance concurrent data structures. And in particular, uh, the, the sort of big ticket item is lock free data structures, which I'll spend a lot of time telling you about tonight. Um, but I'm also interested in user space synchronization, um, which is closely related, things like uh, semaphores, barriers, latches, and so on. Um, and then a sort of central topic that, that ties all this together, which is uh, concurrent memory management. So a lot of work on lock-free data structures ends up assuming that you have a garbage collector. We don't have that luxury in Rust, so we have to deal with uh, memory management in some other way, and that ends up being one of the big challenges. So I'm gonna spend a lot of time uh, in this talk talking about the memory management approach as well. Um, so to start off with a bang, uh, here's a comparison of uh, some of what Crossbeam uh, provides to some of the state of the art uh, elsewhere in, in the sort of tech ecosystem. Um, so Java is actually a place that has a pretty strong story for things like lock-free data structures. There's a, a library called Java Util Concurrent that has similar goals to Crossbeam and provides a variety of data structures. Um, and so here I'm comparing uh, the Java concurrent linked queue in that library, um, a hand-rolled implementation of a similar queue in Scala, and then two queues that are implemented in Crossbeam. Um, and here, lower is better. This is the uh, uh, amount of time sort of per queue operation uh, in a multi-threaded uh, test case, right? So this is, this is basically just showing like the overhead of the memory management scheme I'm gonna show you today uh, is quite good. And in, in fact, it's pretty easy to, to do better than Java. So the Java concurrent link queue here is highly tuned. The stuff in Crossbeam is like textbook algorithms uh, with very little effort put into them. Okay. Uh, yeah. Just real quick, uh, does that Java, does that include the Amorphan cost of garbage collection? Does the Java benchmark there include the amortized cost of garbage collection? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I mean, and, no. yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get into more detail on this. I should say, feel free to ask questions throughout. Um, this is definitely going to be a little bit more technical than the previous talk. Um, okay, so I realize that probably a lot of you don't know a lot about this low level area of concurrency. So I wanna start by talking about some of the important trade-offs in that space. Um, and so of course we have to talk about the cache. Um, that's, that's always a huge determiner of performance. Um, and the cache story gets a lot more complicated once you start talking about having multiple cores, right? So this diagram shows a fairly typical architecture where you have a number of different cores on the same die. Each of them has a dedicated L1 cache and then they have a shared L2 cache. Um, 
So the interesting thing about this is uh, there's a coherence issue, right? If you have an address in memory, that could potentially be in four different caches, right? In any of the L1 caches of, of these four cores. How do you actually ensure that all of these cores think memory has the same value? Um, there's a protocol uh, for doing this. Um, a typical one is the so-called messy protocol for cache coherence. And the idea is pretty simple. Basically, each cache line has a state at any given time. Um, modified just means that it's, it's dirty. Basically, it needs to be written back to RAM. Exclusive means it hasn't yet been changed, uh, but this core is claiming it is the only one with a valid cache line for this address. Shared means perhaps multiple cores have this cache line out, but none of them is in a position to write. They all agree on the values. And invalid just means this cache line is, is invalid, unusable. So there's a protocol basically where if one core wants to write to a piece of memory, it has to get the relevant cache line into exclusive mode and tell all the other cores to flush their caches. And so you, you end up operating in this space where cache locality becomes way more interesting. And all of a sudden, the things you're doing on one core can have radical effects on things that are going on in another core. Um, and so you have to think a lot about this when you're doing these, uh, these sort of fine-grained uh, concurrent data structures. So in particular, if you want this stuff to go fast, you need to minimize the amount of coordination between cores. Because basically, every time you have to coordinate between cores, you're taking at least an L2 cache miss, right, to sort of get out and around one core and into the other, uh, you're talking about a, a cache miss at that level, which is relatively expensive. Right? So what you want is to be able to access uh, shared data structures where if you're accessing different parts of the data structure, say you have a shared hash map, and one core is looking up one key, and another core is looking up a different key, and those are in different buckets, those cores should not have to talk to each other. They should not be invalidating each other's cache lines. Um, also, if all you're doing is reading, you really shouldn't be switching cache lines into exclusive mode where you're flushing out the cache lines on other cores, right? All of these things, if you, if you don't have the properties I'm listing here, you end up causing cache misses all over the place. Um, and then finally, sort of the strangest thing at all, of all, sometimes when you're working in this space, you actually don't want cache locality uh, because it's easy to have packed into a, a data structure some data that is relevant to one core and some data that's relevant to another, they're sitting on the same cache line, and now the two cores are basically ping-ponging the data back and forth every time they want to write. This is called false sharing. Um, OK, so that, that's like some sense of the kind of space we want to work in. Um, so let me get a little more concrete about what this means for programming. All right, so going back to a hash map example, if you want to share a hash map between a bunch of threads concurrently, the simplest thing to do is just throw a mutex around it, right? Now all the operations are thread safe, uh, but this is really bad news in terms of the things that I just mentioned before, right? So I was saying, we need disjoint access parallelism. We need to say, if you're accessing two different keys, you don't have to talk to another core to do so. But if we have a single global lock around a hash table, every access to that hash table involves essentially a cache miss if it's going between two different cores. And even if we're just reading, we still end up writing to memory. We still end up invalidating these cache lines. Um, now, there's, there is a sort of finer grained approach where instead of having a global lock around the hash table, maybe you just have locks around each bucket. But that's still not as good as you might hope for because, again, when you're reading from the hash table, you still have to acquire those locks. That still involves a write. That can still lead to cache misses. Okay? Does that all roughly make sense? The details here aren't super important. I just want to give you a flavor of, of the kinds of things you're thinking about. OK, so all of those concerns uh, lead you in the direction of something called lock-free data structures. Um, so this is basically, I mean, if you think about it, locks fundamentally can't achieve the goals that we set out in the beginning. They can't, they can't let you avoid doing a write when all you want to do is read. So we need some other way to access concurrent, uh, to, sorry, to control concurrent access to a data structure that doesn't involve locks. Um, so I want to teach you briefly how to write a lock-free data structure. And I'm going to use the sort of hello world of lock-free data structures, which is a stack. Um, and it's not nearly as scary as you might think. It's actually pretty simple. Um, so the representation we'll use for the stack is just a simple linked list, right? So the, the stack has a head pointer um, pointing to the current head, and then nodes just have singly linked list all the way to the end. 
So can everybody read that? It's kind of small. Um, my apologies if you can't. Uh, so here's the code for pushing onto such a stack. So we allocate a new, a new node that's not real interesting. Um, we turn that into a raw pointer, whatever. Those are just some details in Rust. And then we enter into a loop. And the idea with this loop is we're going to try to optimistically sort of install this node onto the stack. And we're doing so in a way that might be racing with other threads. We might lose that race. And so then we have to come back around the loop and try again. And what I mean by optimistic here is we're going to take a snapshot of the current head. So we, we load the value, the current head of the stack. That's, that's some pointer. And then we go ahead and take our node and say its next pointer is whatever that snapshot was. And then we try to install that node in the front of the stack, basically. And we use an operation called compare and swap. Compare and swap is, is like the basic building block of all atomicity um, on most processors. And what it says in this case is, I think the current value of head is n. And I want the, the, the value of head, sorry, I think the current value yeah, of head is head, excuse me, in this case, self.head is head. And I want to update it to n. Um, and that update should take place in a single atomic step as far as all other cores are considered, right? So I'm not grabbing any lock here. I'm just doing the change in place. But if atomically head has some other value than the one I expected, then this just won't do anything. And the result I get back is essentially what value did head actually have. So I see, I ask, is it the value I thought? Is it equal to head? If so, good. I succeeded. I can leave the loop. I've actually installed my pointer. If not, then I lost the race with some other thread. They got there first. I have to try again. Okay, so let me, let me show that to you more graphically. All right, so say this is the current state of the stack. We have a head pointer. We have two nodes. A thread comes in, and it wants to push this node uh, with the value 7. So it allocates that node. It reads the current value of head and links it, links it into the allocated node, but it hasn't yet changed the head pointer. Meanwhile, some other thread comes along and pushes a different node in. Right? So now we have our local node that has 7 but the actual head pointer has changed. At this point, if we do our compare and swap, it's going to fail. Because we think that we're pointing to the node that contains three, but actually that's changed. That's good, because if we actually succeeded, we would have just dropped the node with five on the floor. right? That's what we're trying to avoid. Um, so then we have to retry. We'll get a fresh snapshot. We repoint our tail pointer. We do another CAS, and this time we succeed. OK? That's how you push in a lock-free way. Uh, before I go on, any questions? Is that mostly making sense? So I'm new to Rust. Uh, I guess in C, like, you, you know how you have volatile? There's nothing like that in, in, in Rust. Uh, so, right, so if we look back at the representation, basically everything you need to declare is in this atomic pointer aspect, right? So that's, that's enough to tell Rust and LLVM you know, I'm going to be modifying this in a sort of concurrent way, in a racy way, right? And that's, that's what makes what we're doing here not a data race, but actually a synchronization race, which is a good kind of race. Um, OK. Uh, because like the whole point is it's valid for different threads to race over pushing on a stack. We're just trying to make sure that they don't uh, destroy the basic invariance of the stack when they're doing so. Do you have a question? Or no? OK. Um, so let's look real quick then at pop, which is pretty similar. Um, so in this case, we, we don't need to do any allocation up front, right? We're just trying to pop a node off. So we enter right into our retry loop. We grab a current snapshot. If we see that the head is actually pointing to null, then we have nothing to do. We have observed a moment in time where the stack is empty. And so we just return the stack was empty. There was nothing to pop. Otherwise, we take a look at what that the node we just snapshotted, what we think is the current head, we look at what its next pointer is, right? And then we go back around and try to change head from the one we read to its next pointer. And the same story happens. If someone else, if some other thread pushed or popped a node in the meantime, this compare and swap will fail, and we'll try the whole thing again. Um, and for people who know Rust deeply, you understand what the pointer read stuff is doing here. For people who don't, don't worry about it, the key point, though, is this implementation leaks nodes. 
Okay, you have to understand some of the subtleties of Rust to actually like be able to see that this is happening. But effectively, we're using these raw pointers, these unsafe pointers in Rust, and those don't have any automatic uh, dropping going on. We have to actually get those into some own value in order for them to, to be deallocated. So here, we're just reading the data out of the node and then not doing anything. Okay, we successfully delinked the node, but we never actually free its memory. We have a link. Okay, now, if this were Java, we'd be done, right? Because the garbage collector has our backs, and that's great. Um, but things are not so nice in Rust, okay? Uh, so, you know, you might, you might think, well, okay, let's just deallocate it here. What's the problem, right? We know that we are the only thread that popped this node. Nobody else is going to be deallocating it. Why not? It's too good to be true, right? <laughs> um, so the problem is, and this is, this is quite subtle, um, but if we go back to this pop implementation, there's something very interesting going on here. So we take this snapshot of the current head. Now we have a node in our hand. And the moment after that snapshot, that node may or may not be in, in the stack. We have no idea, right? This is totally concurrent. We haven't acquired any locks. No other thread even knows we're here, right? So we have this node in our hand, but the moment after, we really have no clue what's going on with this node. But we're about to follow its pointer and get a field out of it. If that node was popped in the meantime and someone freed it, seg fault, right? So basically the problem is there are these aliases to the nodes floating around because other threads are taking snapshots and following those pointers. We have no clue this is happening, so we don't know when we can actually safely deallocate the memory. And that's the fundamental memory management problem here. Now in the GC world, again, everything is great because, you know, sort of concurrently at some point the GC will run and it'll clean up everything. It'll realize there are no snapshots left, so it's okay to actually deallocate this. Um, but we have to find some other way to actually achieve this goal in Rust. Make sense? Any questions? Cool. Okay. So how do we do it? Um, okay, so there are basically two main observations to make at this point. So the first I've already sort of mentioned. Like the, the basic problem here is, yeah, we know that we're the only thread that actually unlinked this node from the data structure, but other threads could have stale snapshots to that node, and they might want to actually dereference those snapshots. So that's, that's problem number one, or observation number one. Um, but there's another observation, which is that once we've removed the node from the data structure, no new snapshots are going to be made. Right? The only way to get a snapshot is to start from the head of the data structure and actually follow a pointer that reaches this piece of data. But we just removed the key pointer from head, right? So there's, there's no way another thread could create a new snapshot. So it's just a matter of waiting until all the snapshots that are in flight right now have gone away. We just need some way to figure that out, okay? But the problem is the whole point of this exercise, the whole reason we're doing lock-free programming in the first place is to avoid coordination between threads. But now we need to coordinate between threads to figure out when it's okay to actually deallocate these snapshots, right? So that's, that's like the, the nut that we really need to get at. Okay, here comes our salvation. Um, so there's this awesome idea called uh, epoch-based memory reclamation. And this is uh, the memory management strategy that Crossbeam implements. I'm just gonna give you the high level intuition about how this works. I won't go super into detail. Um, but basically, the idea is that we're, we're going to have these grand epochs of time that all threads more or less agree on. And as the epochs progress, snapshots in old epochs, we know are stale and are sort of no longer a concern. Basically, we have some way of telling all threads have moved their epoch forward, and now it's safe to, to remove this node because no new snapshots could have been made. Right? That's, that's like the, the very vague intuition. So the way we do this is, there are three epochs ever. Three is a very interesting number. You'll, you'll see why three a little bit later, but just trust me for now. We have a global counter that says, what epoch is it? Zero, one, or two. And then each thread has a, a local snapshot of which epoch it is, and a flag that basically says, is the thread doing something with the data structure right now? 
Like, is it in the middle of a kosher epoch? And for each er epoch, we have a sort of purgatory. So this is like a place to put nodes that are no longer reachable from the data structure in this epoch, but might still have some outstanding snapshots. Right? So we can't actually free them yet. We know we're going to free them later, but we need to wait until the epochs have progressed far enough before we can do that. OK. If we want to do an operation like push or pop, we, we do this pinning operation that sort of enters the epoch system. So we set our th thread's active flag. We say, hey, we're doing an operation on the data structure. We take a look at the current global epoch, and we copy it into our thread local snapshot. At that point, we get a very strong invariant that says any data that is reachable right now from the data structure will remain allocated until this thread becomes deactive. We have pinned the global epoch to this value, and we know until we leave our operation, nothing that we could ever encounter will be deallocated. And that's, that's the key thing we need to do this risky business of like taking a snapshot and then dereferencing it. On the other hand, if we get into a state where we've popped a node and we actually want to deallocate it, we don't deallocate it right now. We put it into the purgatory for this epoch, and then it'll get cleaned up later. Okay. And that's basically the story from the local thread's perspective for doing an operation. Of course, eventually, you want to actually free some data. right? That is the point. Um, and so the way you do that is you look at all of the threads that are involved with this data structure. Any of the threads that are active, you check their current epoch counter. If all of them are at the current global epoch, then you attempt to move that global epoch forward by one using a compare and swap to make sure you, know, you settle races to collect. And if you're successful, then you can reclaim data from two epochs ago. Okay, and this is where the three epochs come in. So the tricky thing is you can end up with active threads at any time in one of two epochs, um, basically the current one or the one just behind. And the reason is once we do this compare and swap that's being described on this slide, we still have a bunch of active threads that are in the old epoch, but some new threads could come in and be in the new epoch we just moved to, right? But we know that no active threads will be in three epochs ago, and we can sort of clean out their data. Okay? Like I said, I'm giving you a high-level description. Don't worry if like, you don't 100% follow it. It's, it's kind of subtle stuff. Um, but at the end of the day, it's, it's actually not that hard to implement. OK. So the algorithm I just described has some really neat properties with respect to the cache concerns I was telling you about at the beginning. Right? Um, so I was saying like, the whole game here is we want to coordinate without a lot of cost, right? We want to coordinate in a lightweight way. And so the thing is, we don't have to collect data at every operation, right? We can batch it up and deallocate it occasionally, right? When, just like we were doing a GC when we we're sort of running, running low uh, in the nursery or something. Um, moreover, because we're doing this infrequently, the global epoch is usually staying the same, which means all those different L1 caches can have the cache line with that global epoch in the shared mode. Right? They're not invalidating each other. When you do that, that read of the global epoch, you're getting a cache hit most of the time. Right? It's pretty cheap. Um, your thread local epoch is usually in the exclusive mode because other threads aren't reading it most of the time. So that's cheap to write to. That's not a cache miss. So the only time you incur real coordination costs, like cache misses, is when you actually do a garbage collection, basically. And those are infrequent. We win. Okay? And moreover, you can apply a single epoch management scheme to any number of lock-free data structures. Right? So you don't even have to do this in a per-data structure way. You can sort of amortize it over everybody, um, which is how Crossbeam is set up. All right. Any questions at this point? When do you decide to collect? So there are lots of ways you could do that. Um, for, so Crossbeam works tweaks a few details from what I showed you. In Crossbeam, each thread actually has a local purgatory. And basically, when that purgatory gets too big, it says, oh, I should probably try to free this, this data. Um, but like, there are, you can imagine many, many schemes for doing this. And it, it's basically orthogonal to the main algorithm. 
Other questions? How do you handle the the per thread state? Do you have to like uh, say up like like ahead of time there will never be more than 100 threads, or is it like dynamically sizing? Or uh, yeah, it's it, you don't have to say uh, ahead of time. It it's basically there's there's like a thread local variable for enrollment, and the crossbeam API just takes care of the rest. Um, so it's it's pretty straightforward. Like basically once once a thread has enrolled once, uh, then it's it's sort of visible for epoch management forever thereafter. And the enrollment is something that the clients don't have to worry about at all. Like you just use the data structure as normal and everything's taken care of for you. Okay, let's talk some Rust. Um, so the other interesting thing about this library is like, or about memory management in particular is how can we take all those ideas and wrap them up in a nice Rust API, ideally with as little unsafe code as possible. Um, and this is one of the parts that ended up being sort of most exciting to me. Um, so the basic idea here is we have a sort of suite of data types that's part of Crossbeam that represents working with the epoch management scheme. So the first thing is a guard. This is like an RAI style guard. And basically this represents I am in the process of doing something on a concurrent data structure. Right? So I described this pinning step earlier that you had to do when you started working on a data structure. And when you were done, you unpin by just setting your active flag to false. Um, that whole algorithm is encapsulated in a guard. So you just call pin. You get a guard back. That guard sticks around. And when it's dropped, you exit the epoch management scheme. Okay? As we'll see later, various other APIs take a guard as an argument as kind of evidence that you've correctly entered the epoch scheme. So you can't get it wrong, right? You can't interact with the data structure unless you've advertised that you're interacting with the data structure in the right way. Okay, so that's part one. Part two is we have uh, some pointer types that are sort of akin to the ones in the standard library, but they're meant for me this style of memory management. So we have owned of t, that's basically like box of t, it's just a piece of heap allocated owned data. We have shared, uh, which looks just like a shared reference, um, except it's, it's memory managed by this epoch scheme. And we have atomic of t, which is just like atomic pointer that we saw earlier. But the really cool thing is, this is the most exciting thing to me, owned and shared implement DREF safely. So they're just totally normal pointers. If you have a shared pointer with a lifetime and you're in that lifetime, you can dereference it without writing unsafe code even though like, that memory is undergoing all of this concurrent uh, memory management, right? So here's how it works. The atomic type, so this is the, the type that you use for doing these kinds of uh, atomic updates, has a bunch of operations, load, store, compare and swap. And these interact with the guards that I mentioned before in a sort of interesting way. So if you load uh, a piece of atomic data, Oh, I didn't mention this before. So there's this whole business about ordering, like you saw relaxed and released before. Ignore all of that. <laughs> it's a whole other dimension that you just shouldn't care about right now. Um, so putting that aside, uh, if you want to load a piece of data out of a, out of a pointer that's managed by this system, you have to have a guard already. You have to have proof that you're in the epoch scheme, right? That's this ampersand take a guard. And what you get back when you load is a pointer is a shared pointer to the data that you were trying to load. But that shared pointer here has a lifetime that's tied to the borrowed guard that you passed in. So this is basically saying, I'll give you a pointer back, like a snapshot that you might want to dereference later, and that snapshot is valid for as long as the guard is. And that's, ex that's exactly what we wanted, because I said, you know, remember before I said the key invariant is once you've entered an epoch, you've pinned it, Nothing you can see could be deallocated until you exit, right? And that's exactly what this is capturing. It's saying, for as long as that guard is valid, until the point you've exited, it is valid, it is safe to read this snapshot that you've just taken out, okay? Um, and then for storing, you don't actually need this guard because you're not getting something that you are gonna dereference, you actually have something in hand and you're just pushing it into the data structure. Okay, so there, like I said, there are a few more operations like this, but load is really where all the interesting action is. 
So when does the guard become invalid when it goes out of scope? When, yeah, when it goes out of scope. So like, we'll, we'll see an example of using the guard in just a second. Oh, sorry, yes. So the shared there is borrowing the guard, but it's not borrowing the atomic. So what happens if you store the atomic when you have a shared? Sorry, what happens is if you- Is it safe to store the atomic while you have a shared load? Yes, so the, yes. Because the atomic was just a thing that was storing the pointer. You've now okay. gotten it oh, out of the atomic. atomic pointer, okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. This is the like atomic pointer, exactly. Other questions? Yeah, I got one. Uh, <laughs> uh, you might get into this later, but uh, I, I'm not sure if you already said this or not, but uh, does having an outstanding loan, uh, does that prevent epoch from advancing? Yes. Or could this hold like allocation, like so if you have a, reserve a slot for a long time, it can Yes. Us. Okay. Yeah, as long as you are holding on to a guard, no memory is being free, right? This is all about, but the, but so the thing is, lock-free data structures are non-blocking data structures. They're, they're data structures where you expect to have a quick interaction and then you're out, you're done, right? There are these tight little retry loops. Um, so most of the time you're sort of going in and out of epochs very quickly and so you expect not to hold up the process of a collection very often, right? It shouldn't take that that long for all active threads to cycle out of the operation they're doing. You could get it wrong, obviously, but if you do, you have bigger problems, basically. <laughs> uh, okay, so there's one more operation, um, and this is the one place that you get unsafety in Crossbeam, um, which at some point, you have to say, I believe that this piece of data is ripe for deallocation. Right, that state is you, you know w when you're using these um, these pointers like you can create a big nest of aliased data. There's no way the library can know when you've actually like unlinked a piece of data from the data structure and it should go into the purgatory. You have to say when that is, and you can get that wrong. Right, the name here unlinked is meant to imply that you're making an assertion when you call this thing. Right, this is safe to call when you have a shared pointer that you know is no longer reachable from the data structure. But that's generally not very hard to find out. Um, there's, there's almost always an obvious point where you've now successfully popped, right? And that's when you unlink, as we'll see on the next slide. Okay, so here is the pop code I showed you before, but now using Crossbeam. It looks pretty similar, except the first thing we do before we enter the retry loop is we actually pin an epoch and we get a guard back, right? This guard is gonna stay in scope for the duration of the loop. Um, now I know I'm gonna get a question, why don't you put the guard inside the loop so you're like entering and exiting each time so you're not holding up data as long. You could do it either way. Um, it, it really doesn't matter. Uh, yeah, I, and I haven't exhaustively tested to see which, which one is faster. It probably depends on exactly what you're doing, but either is valid. Um, this is sort of the simplest thing to do. So, Here's the interesting thing, right? So now we're, we're coming in, we're taking this name snapshot from head that we took in the original algorithm. Um, so either we'll get that there was some head or it was empty. The empty case is the same. If there was some head, now we have a snapshot in our hands. And just as before, we can dereference right through that snapshot totally safely, no problem. Uh, so we pull out the next pointer out of that snapshot, that's fine. We try to do our compare and swap, or, uh, or yeah, CAS shared here. Um, and by the, yeah, so the API is slightly different than the one I showed you before. Here it just returns a Boolean, was it successful or not? So if it's successful, then we enter a bit of unsafety, which is just to mark the node as unlinked, and then extract the data. And that's it, okay? So a key observation here is like, I walked you through this complicated description of this algorithm, but as a user of, of the library, you don't have to know any of that stuff, right? All you need is this epoch pin, guard unlinked, and that's basically it. Otherwise, the code that you're writing looks as if you were programming in a garbage collected language, right? You can take an algorithm from Java, port it over to Rust, sprinkle in a few unlinks at key points, and you're good to go. And you get performance that's better than Java when you do so, right? So that's, that's the sort of essence of the memory management story in, in Crossbeam. Okay, I'm gonna wrap up here. Uh, so let me just say a few things about what else is going on in Crossbeam. Um, 
so the, the bulk of the implementation right now is the, the epoch uh, algorithm and API that I showed you. There's also uh, two multi-producer, multi-consumer queues. Um, one of them has uh, a blocking mode if you, if you want to block when no data on the queue is available. Uh, there's also a uh, work stealing deck, uh, thanks to uh, Alex Creighton. Um, and there's a scope thread abstraction, which is kind of a random thing. Uh, uh, it's a little different than the rest of these. Um, okay, so that's, that's what's in it today. But what I would like to do over time is, like I said at the beginning, really make Crossbeam uh, you know, a strong utility library that offers a number of concurrent data structures in this vein. So the most important one to tackle, of course, is concurrent maps, concurrent hash maps in particular. Um, that's a massive implementation challenge, but in Rust, it's also a very interesting API challenge. Uh, for a fun exercise, think about taking the current sequential API for hash map and think about how you'd have to change it if you wanted concurrent access. It's less obvious than you might think. There's lots of subtlety there. Um, so I'm really eager to experiment in this space. Um, but there are lots of other kinds of collections, sets and bags that you'd like to have as well. Um, synchronizers, as I mentioned before. And then uh, sort of looking far into the future, uh, going higher level and actually offering ways of like doing composable concurrency. So um, in my uh, PhD work, I did something called uh, reagents, which is basically these kinds of lock-free data structures, but with a way that you can compose their operations together. So say atomically, either do this or that. Um, and I would love to do that someday in Crossbeam, but there's a lot of work before we get to that stage. Um, yeah, so that's, that's basically it. I'm happy to take more questions. Mike. When you talk about concurrent hash maps, are you thinking of cliff clicks or are you thinking of something simpler? <laughs> something simpler to start? I, I would probably start with uh, something closer to Dougley's implementation in Java. I thought concurrent. that was stripe locks. I thought that one was stripe locks. Uh, it's, so it originally had some locking. It's moved gradually over time to a more and more lock-free approach. Oh, OK. OK, I wasn't aware of that. Yeah. Um, but I'll probably start here, actually, with skip lists, just to work on the API space before really working hard on the implementation. Yeah, I mean, it would be awesome to have clip clicks. Yes. <laughs> yes. But it's like 100 pages long. Yes. <laughs> yeah, uh, so I've heard of this ABA problem, where um, <laughs> structure gets deallocated, and then later, uh, the memory address gets reused, and so your cast succeeds when it shouldn't have because the pointer is the same, even though it's a different object. So, uh, how does Crossbeam pre prevent that? The same way garbage collection does. It's beautiful. So, basically, uh, so the way that right. So let me let me make sure everybody understands the the problem here. Right. So, the issue is um, uh, if you take a snapshot, you have you have a pointer in hand now. Um, you're going to do a compare and swap based on that pointer later. But it might be in the meantime that it's been deallocated, reused for a different purpose, and relinked back into the data structure. Now your operation succeeds, and it should have failed, and you've ended up with something bogus. Right? This can't happen with the epoch scheme because that you just read that pointer out of the data structure, and you have an epoch pinned. And the basic invariant says that data cannot be freed until you exit the epoch. Uh, so it's guaranteed that that address won't be reused or recycled or put back into the data structure until you've exited, at which point it doesn't matter. You're no, you're no longer about to do this cast. And the same thing happens in garbage collected languages like Java. Um, basically there, the snapshot that you're holding in your hand is a GC root. So that data won't ever be reclaimed or reused until you've exited what you're doing. It's, it's basically the same principle. Um, judging from like the pointer read after the unlink, I, I would assume that like the the when you're freeing an epoch, you're not actually running destructors. Uh, yes, correct. And I, yeah, I think there's actually no way to safely do so, and, and I don't think you really want to. Um, it doesn't fit what you what you're generally doing with these data structures. So this seems like it would do fairly well under high contention. Um, I'm wondering about low contention cases. How, how well this scheme works if, like, you most of the time only ever have one thread reading data, say. Right. Um, does the, like, overhead of fiddling these epochs all the time uh, start to add up? 
so that's, that's a great question. Um, I think the, the cost of fiddling the epochs is basically trivial in that case. Um, you're just like incrementing some, yeah, yeah, exactly. And an uncontended CAS is, uh, you know, pretty fast on like modern Intel chips. Um, but I, so, so that's one potential source of overhead. The other is that you have this purgatory. So instead of like just freeing memory directly, you're actually accumulating memory to free later. And there's some allocation involved there. Um, but generally, if you're following the scheme I mentioned earlier, where you just you do that free every time you get up to a certain size, you just keep reusing that same purgatory list over and over, so the allocation is amortized. So I think it's not it's not too bad, but it depends. It basically comes down to how fast is an uncontended CAS on your architecture. On a previous slide, you listed a user space synchronizer called Phasers. What is that? <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, where was that? Oh, I see. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was way earlier. Okay. Um, so yeah. So phasers are another. So I'm I'm very inspired here by Java Util Concurrent. I sp basically spent my PhD worshiping Java Util Concurrent. Uh, uh, so it's an abstraction there that um, is sort of similar to a barrier, but it allows a much greater range of operations. You can talk about threads coming and going, like uh, basically choosing to participate in the barrier and then changing their mind, and so now their account doesn't matter anymore. And this kind of thing is actually used to implement some kinds of work stealing schemes um, and other kinds of parallelism support. Uh, so it's, it's a building block. It's not that important, but. Is the purgatory, uh, is there a global purgatory or per data structure? Uh, neither. So in Crossbeam, there's a per thread purgatory. Um, well, there's primarily a per-thread purgatory, which is shared amongst all data structures uh, for that thread. There also has to be a global purgatory as well, because a thread can be in the process of shutting down, basically, fail to advance the epoch far enough to be able to actually reclaim that data, and to avoid leaking it, it has to go post it to a global purgatory. How do you deal with adding kind of abstract data into the purgatory and still knowing how to what destructor to run for that data? Uh, it's just a V table. Basically, you, it's if you think of drop in sort of trait terms, um, that's just the usual sort of heterogeneous collection story. Yeah. I have a question. Actually, actually, I have two questions. One's super lame, but but one's yeah, it has some guts to it. One is. The super lame question is, how did you get your little, uh, like, the the lines to move in your animation? That was super cool. <laughs> so funny enough, it's called Magic Move in Keynote. Um, so basically, you, you have two slides next to each other that are mostly the same, and some things are different, and it auto automatically animates them. It's wonderful. Oh, that's dope. Highly recommend it. <laughs> um, all right. Real question. Um, so I noticed that you have like a, just like a method that's called compare and swap. And you said in the beginning that your intention was to create a performance set of primitives for you know, uh, parallel, parallel operations and, and data structures. So to what extent does the method compare and swap actually use like the underlying instruction set, um, like comp exchange for, for x86 or something like that? And I, just to build on top of that, um, because I think x86 has like comp hand and all these are like for hand over hand locking for a skip list and so on. Like to what extent does Crossbeam have the facilities for using the underlying instruction set architectures support for locking primitives? Right. Um, okay. So, so for the first part of that question, um, compare and swap here is just a direct map to the sort of basic hardware architect uh, operation. Um, so there's nothing really interesting to say there, I think. Um, for more specialized operations, like, I mean, also fetch and increment is a really important one. Um, I, there's no fundamental reason that that can't be incorporated. Um, I haven't really thought about incorporating locking um, in, into this space. Uh, I don't think there's anything too difficult there. Like, basically, I don't think the, the Crossbeam API would have much of, interesting to say. Like the key thing at the end of the day is to know what memory is being, potentially has these concurrent snapshots that you have to worry about, and to know when you can mark it unlinked, when you know for sure 
that it's no longer reachable from the data structure. So any way you have of getting yourself in that situation, be it partially locks, some mixture of compare and swaps or other operations, it doesn't really matter. The algorithm should still work. I see. I, I guess just to add on to that, like the reason I brought up locking was just because uh, there's a book, I think it's called Art of Parallel Programming. Um, it's by some, some guy in Israel. Um, it, it has a bit about saying that on, on sequentially consistent architectures, like x86 like versus ARM or weak, weakly consistent architectures, it's important to use the underlying microcode or, or rather like the instruction that's responsible for handling um, parallel access or, or locking, even in a case where you'd normally use like a lock-free data structure for performance reasons. But I don't. I read it a long time ago, so I don't really. I, I thought you you would know more about okay, it. Okay, sure. Do. So 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 this is. I think this is connected to the piece that I told you not to worry about at all, uh, which is the memory ordering piece. So actually, x86 is not sequentially consistent. Well, I, I think it's strong. Yes, it is. A, it's a. You know, its memory model is something called total store order. Um, but basic, this is a huge topic. Uh, <laughs> let me summarize it by saying, in the C and C++ world, right, with C and C++ 11, there was an attempt to create this memory model uh, that has uh, these kinds of memory orderings, like relaxed, release, acquire, sequentially consistent, and so on. And the point of this was to not do what you're saying. <laughs> Basically, to let you program at a higher level of abstraction where you can say, I'm doing a read or write. I need to have this amount of information about what other, how it's going to be published to other cores, basically. Like, is there going to be a global order over all reads and writes for this, or is it OK if you know, there's something more subtle going on? And then the compiler will choose the best underlying operation on that piece of hardware uh, to do so. Um, so for x86, for example, uh, sequentially consistent operations require fencing, uh, like a memory barrier. Um, but any of the other orders don't. So it's actually really to your advantage to think carefully about when you can get away with something more relaxed, right? But whatever you do there also applies to ARM and gives you wins there, right? So hopefully you, you can stay abstract away from the hardware. Um, so I don't know. Maybe that's just an optimistic take, but that's certainly what the memory model is trying to do, and Rust inherits all of that 100%. Thank you. Yeah. All right, we've run out of questions. Awesome, thank you guys. I'll be quick. Hyun's already on the screen, so Hyun, please go take it away. Can you hear me? We can, yes. We don't see okay, let's... anything like that yet, though. Oh. Is that sharing? Yep, we see it. OK. Um, Hi, I'm Hyun. I'm a volunteer on the Rust team. And I'll be talking about my library, Simple Parallel. And so there's a link at the bottom if you want to type, in, type it in quickly, which has got various links and the slides and so on. Um, anyway, so what is Simple Parallel? It's designed to sort of be a little bit like Rayon, except worse. <laughs> it's designed to be a really, a really easy way to add a whole pile of parallelism to your code without having to think about it at all. So the main API um, has got these three functions, for, map, and unordered map. And I guess the best way to, to understand what they do and how the library works is to look, in, look at an example. So for this example, I've got a, a program here. It's kind of long, but the, the main point is it takes a list of files on its command line arguments which are images, and then we'll resize those images to be 400 by 400 pixels, and then write them out. But of course, the, the resizing image bit isn't, that, isn't particularly interesting, so let's just focus on the loop in, in the main function, which is just this bit. And so as, as I said, it's got these, this files iterator, which is the list of command line arguments. It will run through it and resize each of those images. This is very sequential. It's only using one core. And like my laptop has eight cores. And most, even phones nowadays, have more than one core. So this is a waste of resources. So instead, we should, we should use parallelism threading, for example. So I'm using the, the great scope thread pool library here, which is uh, good. It gives you precise control about exactly what you want to run where. But it's kind of annoying to use. 
So you first you have to import the crate and then you have to spawn a pool and then you have to avoid the problems with destructors by using this scoped function. And then finally you can run over the images and then spawn a thread to, well, spawn a job to resize each of those images. So it's kind of annoying. It's a lot more work than just writing a for loop. So what if instead of just using normal threading, you could use magic threading? So here's simple parallel. It's got this for function. It's basically literally just a for loop with the iterator and then a closure. So that closure will be run on each of the elements of the iterator uh, and then do its work, and preferably in parallel if you've got multiple cores. Uh, obviously, like I'm saying fast, but is it actually fast? So I ran it on a directory of images. The sequential version took 41 seconds. Scope, thread pool, and simple parallel both took about 10 seconds. So we're saying it's more than four times faster on a machine with four physical cores or eight with hyperthreading. So that's about what you'd expect for a, like a computationally intense task like this. So how does it work? For the, this library is designed to be safe and easy to use. And so it tries to imitate a for loop as much as possible, which is why it takes an iterator as an into iterator instead of just a like a the iterator trait. So this allows it to like you can just pass in a vector and that will automatically be converted into an iterator. These iterators will then yield this item type, which has to be sen, which makes sense. It's get pa it gets passed across threads because that's how the parallelism works. And then the, the function, the closure, is a, a function that takes the items from the iterator, and it has to be sync, which means it can be called, it can be called concurrently on multiple threads. So that signature basically describes exactly what is going on in terms of parallelism and what, what safety constraints you need to satisfy, satisfy. Of course, this makes more sense with a diagram. So here we've got the iterator type, oh, the iterator value, which is the red squares, some long sequence of, of things. And then at the bottom, we've got a thread pool. In this case, it's just two threads. And each of those has a reference to our closure, our func closure. And so to start off, first we'll take the first two elements of the iterator and pa pass them off to the thread pool. And then they'll run. The, the functions will be called concurrently and they'll be running in parallel. And then when one finishes, the next element will be pushed onto the thread pool and then so on and so forth until the iterator has been exhausted. At this point, the for function will return and we'll have finished our for loop and hopefully run jobs very efficiently and quickly. And so now, sharing and safety. Um, like Rayon and like Crossbeam's scoped threads, this is designed to offer flexible sharing. So you can have data that's, you can have references that are point into your main thread stack and manipulate them freely without worrying about problems. So in this case, we've got a, our array data of 10 elements. Then we run in a for loop across those 10 elements, adding this outside variable to each of those. So this would result in data having 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 in it after the uh, for loop returns. So this is perfectly safe. The fact we're using an iterator and that simple parallel is fairly careful means that um, each of those elements won't alias. There's no data races. There's no... Um, mutation of variables that shouldn't be mutated. This particular example wouldn't be very efficient because of full sharing and so on, but you know, it's safe, so that's nice. What about if we made a mistake? If we'd flipped around outside and LM, so instead of adding outside to each of the elements of the array, we were incrementing outside each time. So this would then result in outside having, theoretically, if it ran properly, it would theoretically result in outside having value 46 or 36, something like that. Um, but it's, it shouldn't run because it's a data race. So there's no synchronization in the, in the mutation of outside. 
So if we're running this in parallel, we've got multiple threads modifying this one memory location, and there's no synchronization, which is literally the definition of a data race. This is undefined behavior in Rust and can lead to arbitrary problems, let alone not giving the expected answer. Fortunately, Simple Parallel protects against this problem. So this is the error the compiler emits. It's saying that you can't assign to data because we've got a fin closure, which is telling us that we've got a problem here. We can't mutate things we've captured. We can only mutate the things that come in through the closure argument. Except if we've got a mutex or a uh, like an atomic variable, of course. If you like, if you add your own synchronization, then it's fine. Um, but iterators can also do more than just a for loop. So we've got a instead of giving a useful error message about any errors to resize the image, how about we just tell the user how many errors occurred? So in this case, we map the resizing over the iterator, and then we filter out the ones that are errors, and we count those ones. And so this will, again, run sequentially, and it takes about 40 seconds. It's not particularly different to the for loop version. But with simple parallel, we can parallelize the map. So we can do various setup with cross beam, but then in the middle, we've got the map here. So we've got a map which takes files and a closure, and then that will return an iterator that we can then filter and count, and we'll get the same answer, except faster. So the reason we have to have the cross beam scoped is for the, exactly the same reason that std thread scoped had to be um, deprecated and eventually removed, because we can't rely on destructors to run, which would allow us to sort of leak uh, references and have them still, access, still accessible even after they've been destroyed. It's, a, it's somewhat annoying. It makes the, the syntax here obviously much worse, but it's the, um, the, the pains we take for safety. One subtlety with this function is that it will yield the elements in the order of the input iterator. So if we have files A, B, and C, and we map over with this, we'll get the resized errors, or well, like the, the result of the resizing for A, then B, then C. But it might be that, say, A is much larger than B and C, and so the resizing takes a lot longer. So it might be more useful to uh, get the errors for B and C before A finishes, which is what unordered map does. So it doesn't com impose the, the same constraint as map does, that the, um, the output has to be in the same order as the input, which allows you to start processing things as soon as they finish, rather than in the order that in the order that they came out of the iterator. This is fine for many examples, such as this one, where we're just counting. And so in this case, using unordered map might be slightly nicer than using map, although both of them take about 10 seconds. So I've sort of given an, a high level overview of the API. And so I'll be now sort of summarizing the ugly bits, the bad bits, and the good bits of the API. So I can end on a positive note. So the ugly bits are Really, the internals are pretty ugly. You don't want to look at them at all. There's channels going everywhere and threads being spawned when possibly they shouldn't. But um, the, the, like the API it exposes is, is nice, but it results in quite a lot of performance overhead. And then there's confusion with panics. So you'll usually end up, if a, if a job panics, if one of the closures you pass to for or map panics, then you'll usually end up with double panics and your application will abort. This is really waiting for panic recover to be stable so that I can catch those and then re-propagate them properly without having to rely on um, sort of stack variables and destructors and detecting things that are difficult to detect. And the, the other ugly bit is that to be generic, um, simple parallel just assumes that the, the, its inputs are iterator, which means that it can only call next so that means that you end up um, distributing work very sort of slowly. Unlike, like Rayon, you can split your, your inputs. For example, if you take a, a slice, you can split it in two at halfway. So you've got about half the work going to one thread and half the work going to the other thread. But if you're using just an iterator bound, you can only like, 
steel elements off the front. And so this is much slower and much, um, uh, much more contention if you're trying to do it concurrently. However, specialization should allow us to sort of pull back some of that overhead. So for, for iterators and types where you can take work off more efficiently, uh, Simple Parallel will be able to do that internally. So you'll just magically get faster, faster code if you're using a, an appropriate type. And on the bad, unlike Rayon, Simple Parallel isn't really built up from like a primitive like join, which means it's not appropriate for divide and conquer strategies. So if you've got a tree of work where one job will generate two and each of those will generate two more and so on and so forth, like the quicksort example that Nico was using, then you, then Simple Parallel probably isn't the right library. There's far too much overhead for this. It doesn't use fancy work stealing data structures internally and so on. However, Rayon exists, so you don't need Simple Parallel for these things. So that's means it's not such a downside. However, if you've got a flat, embarrassingly parallel workload, then Simple Parallel is great, especially when those work pieces are quite large. So as I said, there's quite a lot of overhead, but if you're doing something like resizing an image or downloading something off the internet, then you'll be easily able to parallelize with Simple Parallel and get big benefits from it. And of course, as the name suggests, it's simple. You can almo almost use it by doing a text substitution, almost. But, um, uh, well, adding a few parentheses as well. But that's the high level overview of simple parallel, easy parallelization without, um, without much control, but designed for sort of big blocks, big, uh, big binaries and so on, not fine grained work. I think that's all the stuff I've got. Are there any questions? Here's the link as well to the the um, the slides and the code and so on. All right. <laughs> any questions? I don't see any. Thank you, Huan. Thank you very much, and thank you all for Bye. coming tonight. Uh, it was great having you all, and I will see you in February. I think we have the room for a bit longer, so come and mingle. Sorry, Internet people. <laughs> Next time, we'll solve it. We'll have, like, Oculus Rifts and stuff. I think I'm off the air, but...